Hey, uh, everybody, welcome to the on site renovation group. We're out here at uh, Mike Chawanka, the godfather of wholesaling's uh, rehab project in uh, South Atlanta. Mike, say hi to everybody at home. How's everybody doing today? Nice and warm, 50 degrees. I love it. Yeah, we got a real good turnout here today, as usual. And uh, for those that can't make it, we broadcast this on Facebook Live, or those who want to watch it later or have to leave early. Uh, we try to put it online. Uh, we take questions from you while you're here. We also take questions from the live audience at home. I usually start it off by asking uh, the uh, host some uh, questions about the property, then turn it over to you. We usually start out here on the exterior and then end up going inside. And uh, depending on what stage the house is in renovation, sometimes it's just started, sometimes it's halfway through, sometimes it's completely finished. In a case like this where it's not finished yet, Mike may invite us back in a month or so when it's done and we can see the finished product. All right, sound good? Well, I'm going to start by asking Mike some questions. Um, Mike, tell us a little bit about this neighborhood where we are right now. All right, we're located in southeast Atlanta, right off the Lakewood area, uh, right here. This area is just not one of these popping areas like southwest or northwest Atlanta, but you can still make money in the Lakewood area. I just finished up two rehabs on the uh, on the Dell 365 and 354. I sold both of those for 160. Uh, no, both of those sold 20,000 higher than my original ARV on those. So if I have a successful renovation, I try to springboard that off of something else. Because if I know I got something under contract, it's going to sell for 160. So obviously, say, hey, I got to find something within a mile radius and use those comps before somebody else finds those comps, bids everything up, and blah, blah, blah. So I bought this house with two others on a package deal, and I probably paid somewhere uh, mid to low 20s on it. Um, it pretty much was a shell. The whole back end of it was caved in, so I had to get a bulldozer, tear it all off, and all that kind of thing. So it was, it's, it's an extensive rehab, but then again, that's what I do. I do full rehabs, $80,000. If you're going to go ahead and fix something, you might as well fix everything. Yeah. Now, you're known as the godfather of wholesaling. What made you decide to rehab this property rather than just wholesale it? Well, typically, when I have a product that is just so far gone, a lot of my wholesale customers don't want to deal with it. Right. Because, I mean, you really do have to have some experience. And I really don't want to go ahead and wholesale it to somebody and... All of a sudden, they get a contractor, and this guy's a jack wagon. He don't do what he says he's supposed to do when he's supposed to do it. And all of a sudden, this guy's upside down, you know? So, yeah, you wouldn't yeah. recommend a new investor taking on a project like this, would you? No, not if you're a new investor. I mean, if you have somebody that you know that has a solid contractor, and you've seen them do their work, and they went from A to Z, and they pretty met all their commitments on the you know, on the bid sheet and the estimate was there, I mean, hey, 5% cost overruns or something, that's no big deal. But that's your lifeline. If you don't have somebody that you could rely and trust on to do this rehab for you, you're just dead in the water. Um, so as far as the newbie is concerned, I mean, the big success of what I do is I've got a team. They've been with me for 20 years. I could look at them. They know what I'm thinking. And, you know, I've got a dozen renovations going on right now so it's simple for me because I've, I've built that system up but if somebody's new um, I mean don't be scared I mean if you buy one of my houses you can always call me I could refer somebody to you to help you out if somebody bailed that type of thing so never be scared but the money really is made if you could buy something dirt cheap so you got to ask yourself the question do I want to buy something like this for uh, 25,000 or do I want to buy something down the street there for 60,000 okay so now you have a big swing I mean you got a $35,000 swing and said I'd rather throw $35,000 into a shell and I know everything structurally sound so when they come do a homeowner's inspection on you you know they're not going to go ahead and have 50 items and all of a sudden your owner occupant that's got a contract is going to run for the hills because the inspector found a million in one thing. Does that make sense to you guys? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So that's my thought process. I'd rather buy something super cheap and do all the work than just to go in there and say, ah, okay, I'm going to keep this 
or I'll go ahead and keep that. I mean, I'd rather just blow the whole place out, vault my ceilings, open floor plan. You know, if I got to do a new flooring system, roof system, or, or whatnot, if you buy it cheap enough, it really doesn't matter, does it? Now you got this one really cheap in the 20s. Yeah, I um, bought this one in the 20s. And I got one on 1712 Richmond. Uh, that's about the same spot as this one is in the rehab, and I got that one in the, about the same price. Now, what's the uh, after repair value? They appraised at one seven. And how much, uh, since you're blowing the whole thing out, how much you think you're going to be putting into it? I mean, I probably have ninety into it. Yeah. And I probably I sell it for more than one seven. Yeah. You tend to uh, blow out the comps yeah. in the neighborhood. Yep. And once again, you know, this is not one of those severely active areas like uh, Northwest Atlanta or Southwest Atlanta, where you really got a rehab going on every other street, and all of a sudden, you know, two hundred went to two twenty, two twenty went to two forty. And now you're at 300, and you're looking at wholesale deals, and you're thinking, hey, I've never paid 100 grand for a wholesale deal in my life. Do I really want? Do I feel comfortable doing it? Mm -hmm. For me personally, I don't. I have a price point that I sort of stick with, and that's the 180, the 260 price point. And that way, I can manage my money. Um, you know, we got a brokerage firm. We got. If I had 10 listings today, I could sell them by by Sunday. That's how many people are beating down our doors. Uh, for for inventory, yep. um, agents just know that we put a good product on the market. They got buyers. It's it's a seller's market, and we got a reputation in our working area. And, and agents just want want our next house. Right. Um, now, how many you guys know Mike? Mike. Okay. How many yeah. don't? Just raise your hand so he knows who he's talking to. I've seen it. Yep. Mike's been in this business a long time. What twenty something years? 21. And he's famous for going into areas before the other investors rush in and go in there and start rehabbing houses. He drives up the comp. So people follow him and watch him. And then before you know it, everybody's down there in the same area trying to rehab. So he's famous for going into new areas like this and, you know, setting the bar, setting the standard and pushing those comps up higher. Except now there's no more new areas to go to. <laughs> So that's, uh, yeah, it's, so inventory is super, super hard to find these days. And if anybody's out there beating the streets, uh, what people are asking for houses these days are just insane. Yeah, we were, uh, we've been going down to the Hapeville area over the past few months. Right. With the right. renovation group and uh, seeing how the, the purchase prices for the wholesale properties have gone up and up and up. Was down 30, 40, <laughs> 60, 70, 80, 90, now up around 100,000 yeah, for a wholesale I mean, property. Yeah, uh, Depending on which part of hate bill you're in. Right. Besides and I would say, own. and from my experience, 90% of people are just one and done in this industry. Because one, they get overzealous. I can't find anything. I can't find anything. I can't find anything. I want to do something. I got money. I'm approved. Hard money lender. I got to do something. So that overzealousness forces them to purchase something that they pay too much for. They're a motivated buyer. Right. So you can't fix that problem, can you? If you don't buy right, nothing else really matters. So that's why it's crucial. And right now, I mean, I'll be honest with you, if I had 10 wholesale deals, I could sell them within 48 hours like I do. That's, that's how many people have just blown up my phone for something. Um, but do I buy just for the sake of buying? No. So right now, and this happens every year for me, is once you know, everybody gets on that fitness kick in January, right? Yeah. All right, well, everybody and your mother now is saying, I want to buy an investment property. So January is like my, typically my worst month of buying stuff because the competition is through the roof. So usually what happens is, you know, in February, those people will filter out and say they'll either have bought something, paid too much for it, and then they're going to end up making no money when it's all said and done. And then you have all the people that just said, hey, I just can't buy something, I'm not going to do it. So things will get back to normal in about 30 days. Does that make sense to you, supply and demand? Anybody yep. got any questions for me? Got a lot of questions for you. Who right. wants to go first? Yeah, now let me walk over so we can hear you. And you can repeat the question, Mike. All right. All right. Um, how do you pick what areas you're going into, especially since you're going into areas that other investors are not doing any projects in? How do, you, how do you decide which areas you'll decide to target next? That's a great question. 
Because you're famous for flipping in the hood. Right. Okay. So flipping in the hood, the hood is the hood. Everybody knows what the hood is, right? There's good hood and there's bad hood, right? <laughs> I try to go to the good hood. So what does the good hood mean to me? It means question. is there five dudes sitting out on that porch doing nothing at 2 o'clock in the afternoon? That's a problem for me. I wouldn't have bought this house if that was the case because you can't fix that. I could make this house beautiful, that house beautiful, that house beautiful, but you can never fix somebody that's been living in the area for all of these years. This is their home, you're in their environment, uh, they're selling drugs out of their house, and you're not going to stop their business. Um, some of the key elements that I look at when I'm buying in the hood too is, okay, what can I do with this house? If it's a two bedroom, one bath, and it's only 900 square feet, most people say, ah, this is a don't want or no one's going to buy a two bedroom. Well, you could always kick out the back and put yep. an addition in and do a master suite and suite bath, and that's what's going to go ahead and make your house. Um, so you always got to say, oh, can I do this with this product? Some, you know, a lot of times you see a flat roof line. You know, people say, ah, it looks like a mobile home park. Ah, I don't want this house. Well, you just go ahead and put an A-frame front porch on it to go give it some pop. So there's a lot of things you can do to make something that you think has no value to give it some marketability. But what's the number one component? Price. If you don't buy it right, you can't do these things. Now, you mentioned um, things you can't control within the neighborhood, such as people selling drugs out of their house next door. Correct. What about boarded up houses like next door or across the street? Does that concern you? Well, does it concern me? Well, of course it concerns me. Is it a deal breaker? Absolutely not. It look like it. I mean, that's the hood. You got boarded up houses all over the place. The fact that it's boarded up is actually a plus. Now, if it wasn't boarded up and people were vagrants were living in there, that would be more of an issue. But the city will come in and they'll give you a citation. It's called a placard. And that's when you got to board up the house and they put a lien on it, blah, blah, blah. I noticed there's a so, dumpster over there. Is that for the one next door or the yeah, one Yeah, and that was my down? house and I wholesaled it to another <coughs> investor. Okay, so you guys are improving the street. Correct. Mm -hmm. So he's doing a good job over there. So, you know, you know, he's going to piggyback off of this sale and um, that's the way things roll. If you got a couple houses and they all come at them on the market at a particular <laughs> price point, you know, an appraiser can't can't kick it out. Um, Specimen's the nicest thing in the area. No. Mm -hmm. I right, got some more questions over here. I got one. How do you determine your square footage in regards to zoning and all that dealing with the city? How do I determine my square footage? Yeah, your addition that you'll add on to it in relation to the zoning? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, I, I like to have my master suite at least a 14 by 14. And, you know, I like to have at least a 10 by 8 for my bath and the same for my walk-in closet. So that's typically what I do. And, you know, we all know that the secondary bedrooms and the renovations are meaningless. So as long as you got a 10 by 10 or 10 by 12 for those rooms, you're okay. And in these neighborhoods, everybody just wants to see that bling open floor plan, you know, modernized kitchen and bath. you got to have a significant... Uh, um, master. So I think a lot of new investors, one of the biggest mistakes that they make is they don't put any effort into um, their third bedroom or their master master bedroom. You know, they leave it as a 12 by 12 and it's like, okay, well, who's going to go ahead and spend 200000 on a little 12 by 12 bedroom and you got a little bathroom sitting in there and it's only got one sink. No dual vanity, none of that kind of thing. So you got to spend the money or you know, the, the house is not going to fly off the market. Yeah, you mentioned bling, and uh, we know you like doing sexy rehabs. So what's the difference between a, a regular rehab and a, <laughs> a twink, a sexy rehab? Oh, no. we got to answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> well, sexy rehab is we went the contemporary route, which is, you know, most people just do a earth tone, for their interior, exterior, they just use your beige colors, you know, for the walls. But instead, we went with black trim throughout, and we do a silver tradition um, wall. So that's something different nobody else does. And, of course, your kitchens are white, white bat splash. Uh, you know, we do the cross beams, paint them black. 
so the sexiness is that. And when we stage it, it's all white contemporary furniture. Um, and for whatever reason, man, these people just freak out on this stuff. That's probably something your competitors in the area aren't doing. Uh, everybody copies what you do sooner. So or they're trying to make their sexy too. Yeah. Like okay. <laughs> okay. But we trademarked it, so if I really want to be, uh, I can enforce <laughs> enforce it. So. All right. What well, questions over here? Um, we'll get to you. Because of the houses around here are bordered up, right? Are you concerned of holding this house for too long to be sold? Dude, everything we have sells within five days for full asking price or better. Yep. So selling, selling, selling the house is not a problem at all. I've seen a couple. I've seen that uh, house of yours over in um, this Vine City. The one next door was falling down, and you sold it. I believe the one on Ashby Grove. There was two side by side that you were working on in Vine City over there. I think you um, said you might have end up keeping one of them. The one on Parsons Street, Ashby Grove. But yeah, I mean, that's just, so people that are new in this, the first thing they say, okay, I, you know, you don't understand the city of Atlanta. And I was like that 20 years ago. I said, there's no way I'm going to spend a dollar over here. Next time I'm coming down here, I'm going to bring a gun. I, I mean, this is, you know, you, you just don't, I mean, if, you, if you're born and raised in suburban America, you're just not acclimated to this. Does that make sense? Yep. So do these neighborhoods feel, make anybody feel uncomfortable? Everybody's okay? Well, it's not bad. Right. Hey. <laughs> All so, right. So the house next door is not going to affect your ability to sell this quick? No. That was kind of the question. And it was a good question. Good I'm worried about that on the other side of it. You know, what mom is going to say it's okay to buy a house and put her kids next door to a boarded up house? That's what I worry about. Great, great point. Great question. Who is your buyer? So that that's a great question question so who buys houses who wants to move in these areas and the last two years you know like I mentioned we 90% of our business Northwest Atlanta here southeast and typically you just find the same neighborhoods the same products and all that kind of thing so Millenniums we sell most of all our houses from people 25 to 35 years old that are single yeah single I mean, single women, and, and and if they are a couple, they're not married, you know. <laughs> so, um, I mean, we don't get it. It's just, uh, you know, they're just that. That's who buys the houses. I mean, everybody wants to gravitate in town, and anybody that reads trade journals or watches the news or or logs into to any type of real estate network, everybody's everybody knows. These areas are just through the roof. I mean, Northwest Atlanta, like the Gertrude property, uh, appreciated 67% in 2000. 67% appreciation in one year. That's insane. I mean, can, wouldn't it be nice if you could stick your money in the bank and get 67%, right? So um, that's what's going on in here. And everybody knows that, hey, right now it's like the stock market. I mean. You know, people say, when's it going to stop? Okay, the train already left the station. You know, are we at, are we at stop number one, two, three, or are we at four? I think we're between two and three right now. So we probably got one more stop and the party's over. And that's why everybody's getting into the game right now. Okay. Uh, you got a question, you got a question, and you had a question. So let me get to him first, because he was waiting, and I'll get you next. How's that sound? Uh, how long do you keep the house staged? Is it like until it sells or for a couple of days? It doesn't, sound, it doesn't sound like it's long. You're That's, selling in five uh, days. Yeah. <laughs> well, we got eight sets of furniture. <laughs> so a lot of investors asked us to list and stage your houses too. So it's all a matter of do we need it for something else? <laughs> you know, supply and demand type of thing. Yeah. Well, you're selling them in less than five days. Sell them for less than five days, but to answer your question, I will always leave it until the appraisal is done. Oh. So, you know, you put a contract on a house on a Sunday, you might have the inspection on a Wednesday, uh, you know, then you got to go through addressing all the concerns on the inspection report. That might take a week, and then the appraisal is probably 10 days behind that. So, yeah. 
Uh, it, furniture sits in there at least two weeks. Okay. All right, ma'am. I wanted to ask about buying at auction. Do you do that a lot, or? Do I buy at auctions? No, it don't work for me. There's too many people that bid up properties. Have you ever been down to the Fulton County Courthouse? No, I'm not with. Give it, give it a spin. <laughs> give it a spin. Tell yeah. me what you think. It makes me fun. <laughs> yeah, um, auction.com does uh, lunch and learns down there uh, every month. So go check one out. They'll tell you all about the process, give you lunch, and you can watch yourself what happens. Yeah. All right. We had a question over here somewhere. Okay, so uh, back to the neighborhood again, and I guess any rehab. Um, what's the process in security since? So obviously, you wouldn't leave your tools in here overnight, but what do you do to keep prevent break-ins, or how do you work That's all that? That's a great question, Mike. What do you do to prevent break-ins and people stealing your copper and all your new appliances and your AC unit and all that kind of stuff? Well, I usually make a friend, you know, I pay him 50 bucks a week, make sure he watches my property. And then over on uh, my other one on Richmond over there, I got a guy named James living in there. Um, I let him stay. He's a homeless guy. He was staying the next street over. And then he kept around coming around every day while my guys are working. So, you know, I asked my guys, hey, can I trust this guy? Yeah. That type of thing. In houses? No. no. I mean, theft really, I mean, don't think every house is going to get theft, have theft. Um, so a lot of these guys ask about when they're when they're buying in an area they're not familiar with with prime rate. Mm -hmm. You know, AC units disappear, copper disappears. If you've had any of that problem, any of those problems. <laughs> okay, so one, you shouldn't set your AC unit until you're final. Why would you set it? You know, you could still pass your rough inspection without setting your unit. Um, and why would you use copper when PVC is so much cheaper? Two is as you can see, I got my property fenced, so. I try to do that as quickly as possible is just is to secure my property. Use um, security system too? Security system once we got power on. No, security system doesn't go in until we we stage it. Really. Okay. Yeah. 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 Johnny. Yes. How do you go about finding your properties? Do you locate them yourself since you're looking for areas that are uh, not so uh, busy? Or do you have a system in place where you have people looking for areas for you? Johnny trying to ask me that million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. That's his bread and butter. <laughs> All of the above. This is a renovation <laughs> subgroup, right? <laughs> uh, dude, I'd have to take 40, uh, two days to explain that one, really. It's, I can't answer that in one question. But yeah, I mean, I got teams beating the streets. Uh, every area that you learn from Atlanta Rita find houses, we do. Same thing everybody else does. I mean, I think the biggest advantage I have is the fact that everybody knows me in the community. They know I'm a cash buyer. I'm high volume. Bring me something good. I'll close on it as soon as title's clean. You know, so uh, I felt that uh, reputation of trust and... You know, if I say I'm going to close next Tuesday at 10 o'clock, I'm going to close next Tuesday at 10 o'clock. Yeah. You're hustling, too. Hustling. More questions? I got All right. As far as developing contractors, some of these people aren't at your level. So if you're trying to walk that train up that hill, what would you suggest as far as, you know, process, how you vet out contractors, where you, would you find them? Great question. I'll speak to that. Great question. How do Here. new investors find contractors they can trust? <laughs> Yeah, that is a, that's a $2 million question, I think. <laughs> um, my contractors, I've got a set team, okay? And, of course, people come to the job site say, hey, do you need another contractor, that type of thing. And a week doesn't go by, somebody doesn't call me, wanting work. I have a team. We, I've got four teams, so I don't need another team. Um, and that whole vetting process is a process. And you really got to be patient to go through that process. I mean, do you want to go ahead and hang out with this guy for a day and look at his previous work, call his references up, um, 
But that component is your life and death. I mean, obviously, if you don't buy right, nothing else matters. The second thing is the relationship that you have with your people and, and, and making sure they understand your scope of works, making sure they can read building plans. Hey, have they really actually done an addition before? Do they know the codes? You know, you don't want to get done and all of a sudden, you, hey, you know, your peers are correct. And, uh, you know, hey, you didn't double up your two by tens and all this kind of thing. And, you know, you don't have your hurricane straps and blah, 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 and, and getting into a big mess. Um, and, you know, if you're really going to take this business to another level and, and there's a lot of money in this business, is you got to create your success team, your family, and treat them like you want to be treated. And once you do that, I mean, they'll go to bat for you. And as long as, like my guys, they never sat. They didn't sit one day last year. I had work for them every single day. You know, they don't have to go out and bid other jobs. So if you don't provide your people with work every single day, then you're, you're going to lose them. Right. Simple economics, Ryan. Yep. Since we're standing out here, what more will you do with hardscape and landscape on this property? So tell us about the exterior, what you got in mind. Okay, so I will probably till this and lay sods. And I probably, I'm gonna, I would dress up the columns, the top and bottoms paint the porch. It's not more than three steps, so I don't need any railing systems. You know, edge around the tree type of thing. Um, but, you know, people like the cedar look. They like the cedar columns. And you got a fenced-in backyard? Fenced-in backyard. Yeah. I would uh, till it and seed it. Yeah. About what I would do. Do you GC? Do you GC yourself or do you get a GC to pull all your permits? No, I have a G. I got a great guy that does all my permitting. I got a great guy that does my architectural plans. Uh, I got, you know, my survey guy. I, and I got a great expediter that gets it pushed through in the city. So those really are three components. Um, so if you guys ever get stuck in a rock in a hard spot, I can share that with you. Did you set a time when you buy a house, like let's say within a month, within a few weeks, I want to sell it because it needs this much work? And then also related to that, because I believe most people who are going to buy here are going to be FHA buyers and they have like what, 90 day rule or something like that. Does that affect the selling? There are like two Good questions. Question. Good question. Okay, so your FHA 90-day rule. What that is, is FHA, if you are selling a house and the, you, you're selling it for more than twice of what you paid for it, you got to wait. Nine. Okay, well, it, you're not going to get in and out of rehab in 90 days with the buyer. So don't even, that's not even an issue. Mm -hmm. Especially this major renovation. Yeah, that's not even, you know. And even if you finish in 80 days and you get a contract on it, you just rewrite it on the 91st day if you had to. Yep. Right back here? Yeah. Um, Actually, it's, it's 1.2 is the ratio for FHA. It's 120%. Okay. Is um, buying a house near a highway a deal breaker for you? And if not, like what are some things or exceptions you would make if, if the purchase price is good and you actually decide to build right next to the highway. Alright, so listen up here. As, as new investors, the biggest thing that I run into new people getting into this business, you can't make everything a big deal. Okay? I mean, there's every time you walk a house, you, you, you can find more things wrong with it than right, right with it. And you just can't say, eh, I don't like that, I don't like that, this is no good, this is no good. You're going to be missing out on a million opportunities. Um, if it backs up into an interstate, it don't matter. What's good about the house? Do you like the floor plan? Is the square footage adequate enough? You know, what's your back end vision to it? And I think that's most people they they go and they inspect houses, but they don't do. They don't do because they think, okay, I don't like the house across the street. I don't like the neighbors. I don't like you. Know, you just you gotta get that out of your head because there's not a whole lot of opportunities out there in the marketplace anymore. So are there houses like that that you would not do, or do you just simply get them really dirt cheap to make up for those deficiencies? The only, okay, so the only house that I would not buy 
is if I see drug activity on that street. Okay, because I've learned from 21 years of experience, I can't solve that problem. Can I call the cops? Yeah. Are they going to get mad at me because I called the cops? <laughs> yeah. Hey, why is my house on fire? Jeez. <laughs> I probably shouldn't have called the cops. <laughs> So like in this Lakewood area right now, if you go to the corner over there to Richmond um, and you come in off of Madonna and where Jonesboro splits, they put a new supermarket over there, there's just that little pocket by the bank over there that I won't touch because there's tons of foot traffic right mm -hmm. there. So I mean, what's that, maybe four feet, four blocks by five blocks, you know, I get stuff, I don't care if you deed it to me, I don't want it, I do not want it because I know what's sitting over there. Would you wholesale it? No. I, my rule is if I won't buy it for myself, I'm not going to wholesale it for something. And that's a good rule. That's a good rule. Mm -hmm. With your contractors, um, the way you pay them, is it material and labor, or do you get the material yourself and just pay them for labor? Yeah, I pay for materials every day, and then labor is paid on Friday. I have a question related to that. Um, I, I keep hearing that if you buy the materials for the contractor, legally you can get in trouble because they, they are sort of like employees or something like that. How true is that? Like that I, 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 I've seen, I've read mixed stories or things like that about buying the materials for the contractor and then they can, if they get injured or something like that, something legally happens to you. Great question. I hear that too. Really? Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, everybody that works for me signs an indemnity release, mm -hmm. and I get a W-9, and I get a copy of your driver's license, and I get a copy of the insurance. So I'm fully covered. No one's going to get hurt on my job. Mm -hmm. well, no, you, you get well, if they get hurt, you're not going to get hurt, don't you know? Are you going to get hurt if they get hurt? No, I mean, one, I, I'm, I've got an umbrella policy. You know, so, uh, and I've never, I don't run into that. I mean, yeah, because you of all people would have a big bullseye yeah. on you. I mean, I'm, why would somebody get hurt? You know, then they don't work, so. Fall off a of roof. Yes, that's just, that's just one of those seminar topics. You know. Nail their foot to that the That doesn't floor. happen in the real world. <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, I have a good friend down that runs the on site <laughs> renovation group down in um, Tampa, and somebody did get hurt on the job. What happened? He, he, they're threatening to sue him. Threatening to sue him. Right, but what was the injury? Uh, I don't know. I think he fell off the roof. I think he's after putting on some shingles and fell off the roof. Hmm. So it can happen. I guess he's getting out of the roofing business, huh? It, ha it happens. Um, I've heard lots of tales of where the contractors show up drunk to work. But you've got a team you've been working with for a long time that know how you do business. And they're like, I guess, like family to you. Yeah. So you probably don't run into some of these issues. But when the rest of us are new, using, you know, new, unbedded contractors, you, you don't always know what you're getting. And sometimes you get things you don't want. So the only thing that concerns me is some of the things I could have done better in the past, like when I was doing this house, you know, my carpenter has a team of four. Well, he was doing this house and then another house for me at the same time. So he, he brought in like a half a dozen people I'd never seen before. And I said, dude, do these guys know what they're doing? You know? And so that alarmed me. So I said, listen, I'd rather you take another week or two on my jobs and take your time than try to rush it with people that are not skilled. Because those are the people that are just, you know. Those are the ones that get you in trouble. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, one call, that's all the Ken Nugent. And, that's right. You know. That's what we're saying. <laughs> that's right. And so, they'll do that. And, you know, that's just... Like Dustin said, you, you know, if you, you got game and some money in your pocket, you got a target. People come. That's just the nature of the legal industry. Yep. Um, but you name two or three things you're doing to help cover yourself. The umbrella <laughs> policy, the, uh, the release. Right. Uh, things like that to help. If they do get hurt, it's on them. Mm -hmm. W-9, I heard you say. Yeah. Yep. So, so they, they know I know where you live, so, you know. Yep. I was going to say, your umbrella policy, do you have it on your personal self as well as your business or just your business side 
So, and does yeah, that every, everything? All, every one of my entities are covered. And getting back to the material discrepancy that you had, the only thing about buying materials is making sure that materials go to, to your job site. You know. So if you're working with a contractor and he's got multiple jobs, what makes you think all that material is going to your job? Yep. Your wife spent a good bit, deal of time focusing on that at the uh, meeting last month on the panel. Right. About the importance of watching your materials, making sure they're not overcharging yeah. you, not uh, taking your materials for another job, not taking your materials and returning it and keeping the cash. She gave a lot of good information. Yeah, I mean, that's your biggest cost overruns is, is controlling your materials with dishonest people. And, you know, these, you don't think they know the gamut? You know, hey, I'll buy so much, I'll return this. They'll give me a, you know, Home Depot credit card. Yep. It's future purpose. Get a bunch of new tools. Yeah. Your expense. Hopefully my guys don't do that. <laughs> it doesn't sound like it. It doesn't sound like it. All right. So do you have each sub sign all the paperwork or you just have the general contractor sign it and hand it out or how do you work? I That's a great a question. Okay. I act as a general. And then do you have each house under its own separate LLC or do you, is it just all? No. Okay. I got a couple companies I buy under type of thing. So. No. no. Um, she asked a good question about subs, because I've heard this with many of our members, where the GC doesn't pay the subs, and the subs lean their house, and they got to pay twice. They got to pay the they pay the contractor, he didn't pay the subs, then they lean the house, they got to pay the subs themselves. How how do you avoid that? All right, so that's a great question. It happens all the time. That's a great question. You know, so like even the situation I told you over here, or my framer, mm -hmm. I brought a bunch of people over here. So how do I know that he paid all those bunch of people, right? He might have promised them 100 a day or 150 a day. And he probably could have said, yeah, the owner didn't pay me. Yeah, here's 50 yeah, bucks or something, bucks. right? And that stuff goes on all the time because if you get somebody a buck, they're trying to, get like, try to keep as much as that dollar as they possibly can. And you don't have any control over that. Um, but when I pay people on a... The job site's on Friday, you know, I always go, hey, James, did you pay all your guys here? Did you pay them? Yeah. Right, right in front of them, you know? I make them accountable because I've been through that dog and pony show before. Mm -hmm. Nothing makes me more angry when somebody doesn't pay somebody, mm -hmm. you know? I got, I got a real hard time with that. Or they call a bunch of people in to do stuff and they promise them a prize and, you know, <laughs> and with, with some of my guys, I still have to sign contracts with them before they start a job, so there's, there's no discrepancies. You're doing X, Y, Z, and I'm paying you X, Y, Z. End of story. And some guys, you know, I don't, hey, they, their invoices are as good as gold. You know, they've done so many of them for me. Um, so yeah, payment, management, project management, all that stuff, it can, can be exhausting at times. So you guys want to... Take some more questions inside the house. Yeah. Check out the inside. Come on, you'll be the first one inside. <laughs> Come on in. Well, Mike, while we're hey, you, buddy. I'm good. How you been? Good. Mike, as we're moving inside, let's do it. Call you. We just listed a house on La Mesa today. Oh yeah. Yeah. Eight, right I think it's 1818. I'm right off of. Um, same so, Gable. What do you want to listen for? Um, man, you're going to figure that out. Okay. We listed this one for 190 Split level, 2,000 square feet. So, Mike, this was a, I assume, a shell. And everything you see, you've redone? Right, so the whole, everything from here on back is brand new. Just got rid of everything. So uh, this is the original house? This in the front is original. So we vaulted this, and you can see everything that we had to do as far as the structural components of it. Um, if you hire a contractor, you, you really don't know if this guy really knows code. And now, a lot of times, you know, you might, it's, 
might be a good idea to hire a structural engineer and have them come through your house and say, hey, this is not up to code, that's not up to code, and they typically will charge you $400 for a letter. So it's, it gets, it's helpful and you get to know what you can and cannot do after a while. Ian at home said Mike is the bomb. What's that? He's enjoying your uh, live broadcast. Who is? Ian. Okay, yo Ian. What's up, buddy? All right, we had a question here first. We'll get you next. Yeah, so <clears throat> you said, you mentioned, Mike, that you go into new areas where investors are not going in yet. You said the comp. What, how do you determine the square footage for your first comp as you're bringing the comps up in that area? Okay, good question. So what I have learned, people don't really like houses less than 1,200 square feet. So that's sort of like the range of, hey, this is just too small for me, you know? So like in Decatur and a lot of these houses that they built, um, the product that you have in Decatur is entirely different than southeast, southwest Atlanta. Decatur used to have the 3-1, three, 3-1 one, three, one um, cookie cutter, brick houses, mid-century, right? But in these neighborhoods over here, why they're more desirable is because you have a lot of more of these historical houses, you know, which are A-frame front porches, they're frame houses. And you could see back in the day, you know, this was a pretty nice looking house. Yeah, when I pulled in here earlier, it's a historic South Atlanta. Is this particular area right here part of that historic area? Right, when you drove in off yep. the university there? Yep. Yeah. So is this too historic? This, this would this be historic? I would say this would probably run all the way to Browns Mill Road. Did you have to do any uh, special things because it's historic? And can I no, we, but this, this, this whole job was a nightmare with permits, trust that, me. That's it's, the kind of thing I'm getting at with the permitting. Tell us a little bit about that, the permitting process for a lot of these new folks. Well, the permitting process, they got a whole new staff down at the city of Atlanta. So everybody's, you know, you got to do this, that, and the other thing. But, you know, I've got a real good engineer that uh, and a real good architect that you know you go ahead and submit plans and then they'll go ahead and send you a red line sheet and the red line sheet is you know you're thinking man this architect's been in business for 40 years what are you talking about what do you mean he doesn't know what he's doing but they'll come back and say no we want this 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 and this and then they'll come back and say hey uh, instead of the liability coming on the inspector say well no we want a structural engineer to go ahead and give us a letter and, you know, that's what you see right here. Yep. Lorraine Beato said she loves it. Good. Yep. Hey, now, Lorraine. Now, um, you were mentioning the uh, permitting process. Do you, is that guy like your, uh, your permitting expediter? He helps you get this thing pushed through quickly? He does. Yeah, he's phenomenal. Yep. And what do guys like that cost to have somebody do your permitting like that for you? Uh, between expect? 500 to 1,000. Okay, and it sounds like it's well worth it. Yeah. Because, uh, I mean, he's down there sometimes for a whole entire day. I mean, um, it's, it's, it's Because, like, we, we, I told you, we've been down in uh, Hapeville lately. And if you miss that window of opportunity that month to get your permits, you got to wait another whole month in order to go through it again. So, Hapeville sort of like East Point with their, their own little, yeah. Yes, yeah, so you miss. Municipality yeah. and... You go in there in some little little office and take your number, and there's five people ahead of you. Wow. That's yeah, why I don't it, do that much in work in East Point anymore. I just said, man, this is too exhausting. Yeah, you used me. to do a lot down there. Yeah. I thought maybe you moved out because it was getting too expensive or something. Nah, it's just, it's just the whole permitting process is exhausting. Yeah. It was exhausting, so. All right. So City of Atlanta moves along pretty quickly, but they're just doing their jobs, and it is what it is, and, you know, you got to look at it their side of the fence, you know, they're making sure that you put a product out in the market that's going to be here for 100 years and it's not going to fall apart. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, before we take some more questions, kind of describe what you're doing in here for us. Walk us around and show us. Okay. So, you know, when you come into the house and, you know, we all, I try to always do a rehab in the eyes of the consumer. And if you could come in and people, you, you're going to the front door and you can see the back door. That's a, that's a win for me, okay? People get real excited about that. That is called open floor plan. <laughs> What's in. up, Steve? Hey. Come on in, Steve. Yes, come on in, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> how are you doing? Hey, 
Okay, so you got your open floor plan. You got your little fireplace over there. That's going to be your family room. And it's going to open into this room and into the other room. It looks like it's double sided. I can't. Uh, yeah. So you got your you, you got your dining room right over there. You have so here would be my floor plan. So you, obviously you wouldn't put nothing over here. You know, you keep going through here. Here you could put your L-shaped couches. You could probably put two chairs, you, you coffee tables. So you could probably have a sitting area and a little living room area there. Put the TV on top of the fireplace. Um, make that real nice and cozy. So if you walk back here, you got a lot, a lot, a lot of space. Hang a chandelier right here for your dining room table. I'm going to go ahead and put my island right here with a couple bar stools. And you got your cabinets coming all the way through here, your sink, refrigerator, stove, dishwasher. And then I would run my uppers all the way up on top with 42s. Um, you got your washer and dryer over there. Um, you got your master with a tray ceiling. Let's go back to take a look. Nice. So you got a nice walk in. I've gotten away from putting bathtubs in my masters. And nobody really, you know. I'll put a bathtub in my hall bath just in case, you know, somebody's got to wash your baby or something. Um, nobody takes baths anymore. So I put an exterior door over here. If I had to do it again, I, you know, I probably would not have done that. Saved the money, probably. It's nice to be able to walk out on your back porch. Why don't you take a walk out there a little bit? Mm -hmm. Check it out. So as far as one thing that I see investors too, like I said, we list. I mean, a lot of people that buy my wholesale properties, obviously they want us to list and sell it and stage it and all that kind of thing. And I see a lot of people <coughs> cutting corners. Um, on your wood decks and your outdoor living space is crucial I mean if you give somebody a cheesy little 12 by 12 deck man they're gonna go I'm going somewhere else and buying somebody else's house especially if you want top value yeah nice big deck so you spend a couple thousand dollars more on a big deck and it, it, it pays dividends yeah, I got plenty of space out here. And then you know you got a big backyard, blah blah blah. Now, how far does your property line actually go back there? It looks like it maybe go back a little bit further. Yeah, there's survey stakes, but I'm not gonna take any fencing back there. Yeah, but they could use it if they wanted to. They could. They could. Nice fenced in yard for pets and such. Kids. Why do you do trees that you don't really like on the property? Ugly trees like that. Yeah. What do you do, Mike? <laughs> Guess how much that would cost to take down. <laughs> <laughs> how much, Mike? Three to four. And what do you think the arborist might say if you take yeah. that tree down? <laughs> I mean, another three to four thousand dollar fine on top of the three to four that you just spent taking it down. So I think I'm going to leave that tree in my backyard. Yeah, All right. we had a couple questions come in um, uh, from Facebook Live. One was, um, "What kind of permits do you typically need on a project like this?" And that was from Tony. Tony, how are you, Tony? Uh, you need a full-fledged permit. I mean, you just need your building permit. Identify everything that you're doing, and the process is, you know, after you pull your permit, you got to get all your mechanicals taken care of first. Heating and air, plumbing, electrical. Once you got all that taken care of, then you got to get your framing inspection. Then you got to call them back to get your insulation inspection. And then you got to run through and do all your finals. So there's a lot of permitting. Sounds like it. <laughs> um, now, Lorraine Viato <coughs> is on, and um, she might not have been here in the very beginning. She's asking, what's your budget for a project like this? This is a $90,000 budget. Lorraine, I believe he paid around 20-ish. He's got, he's going to put 90 into it. Yeah. Um, this is a, almost a complete renovation. I, I see it probably looks like 10, maybe 15% of original. So why didn't you just 
demolish it and start from the ground up? Is that a historical site thing, or is it cheaper to... That's a, you know, one way or the other? that's a great question. When do you decide to scrape it and start over versus add on to it? Um, I try to keep it because you could still say that it was built in 1935 or something, and, you know, and you could still keep, even though it might be a teardown, you could still keep your foundation, you know, sometimes, a portion of it. Yeah, do they, sometimes do they require you to keep the footprint for permitting and things like that? No, but if you can, I mean, even though everything was torn down, you still had your columns and your beams and your support system that didn't deteriorate because it was brick. So that's, that's still salvageable. And when you do additions, one of the most biggest costs that you just throw out the window is when you when you got to go ahead and dig your footings you know and then you got to put your rebar in and then you got to put your cinder block in and then you got your sill plates and all that kind of stuff and it's like if you could avoid now, that foundation because, expense. yeah foundation expenses is, is an is an expense that nobody sees just like sheetrock you know? so. I got some more questions Thank from the audience um, uh, you said you have an architecture guide for like new investors. Do we need to like go out and find one like that, or can we like buy pre-made like plots or whatnot? Pre-made plans, like pre-made plans, and well, I mean, if you're doing a new build, you could find plans anywhere on site and purchase them. Um, so, as far as my architect, what he has to do is every time I do a rehab, he 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 sketches out what the original plan is and then you gotta submit a proposed plan and a proposed plan has to be approved by the city before you can start. So that's his that's his so where do you job. go to find the architect plan like the floor plans anyway like do you go to like a county site or a third party online site or what? Google. No, what I do is I just sketch something out and I give it to him, say, hey this is what I want and then he does his fancy pants stuff. So you kind of have an idea. You've done this enough to have an idea of what you want. Right, yep. right. So I'll sketch something out, scan it to him, and say, hey, this is what I'm looking to do with this particular property. And you know, I'll say, hey, I want to kick out the back 16 feet, blah, 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 blah. And, you know. and there's plenty of apps, too, for your tablets that you can kind of mock up stuff and share with your architect. Yeah. I was going to say, how do you determine the style of the house? So you've got like the horizontal fencing versus the vertical fencing. Um, and, you know, I've seen a lot of your works at the end of the day. It's you know, very, very like modern looking. And I think, I mean, at least in my opinion, it's modern. But how do you determine whether you're keeping it traditional, more like the Craftsman style, or is it just when you go to the face of the house? You go, okay, this is a XYZ, or try and keep it in an XYZ. Yeah, well, our branding is Sexy Renovations, which is contemporary. Right. So we're going to run that track. Until nobody wants those houses anymore. <laughs> I ain't changed anything that's not broke right now. So. Does that make your projects easier when there's, I hate to use the word cookie cutter, but somewhat similar when you're using the same things in each house? Yeah, because a lot of the agents that like missed out on a house and are waiting for a next one, and you know, they're, they're just expecting something. They're expecting what they just saw. And if you give them something that's different, they don't want it. Um, so if you're going to do cookie cutter, have a nice cookie. And I think everybody should do a cookie cutter. You shouldn't try to reinvent or do something different every time you go. Because your lines of communication, is, for one, with all your contractors is going to be confusing. Oh, you're doing this on this house, but last house you did this. What? No, you know, that's like... And then all of a sudden, you know, you might cross communication paths and all of a sudden... You got a different line of kitchen cabinets in this house that you didn't want. Now, Tony just wrote in, and he was the one asking about permitting earlier. He says, for the proposed plan, kind of what we're talking about now, do you have to have the correct dimensions for approval? What if you want to change during the process and change your plans up a little bit? I think that's what he's asking. How much um, flexibility do you have? Okay, so you first of all, you, you draw up your existing plans, and then you got your proposed plans. So. Tony, don't change it, man. <laughs> Make sure you know what you want when you, when you submit it. Because then you got to go through that permit process all over again. Who wants yeah. to do that? That 
could get a little expensive yeah. in a change order. I assume it sounds yeah, like you don't. You yeah. want to avoid change order. You know what you want to do, so you're, a, you're getting from A to Z as quickly as possible. You don't want to confuse your contractors. You don't want to have breakdown in communications with anybody on your team. You know, and in that way, you're developing that cookie cutter approach, like Dustin said. You know, then it makes things simple because you know once you walk that path, it's so much easier to walk it again, right? And then you walk that path again, and you say, okay, let's see if I could do this faster, less expensive. What can I do better? All of a sudden, you 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 keep you got to keep developing your system. Does that make sense? Yeah. You guys enjoying this so far? Yeah. 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 Well, keep your questions coming. I didn't hear you. What is it? <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. <laughs> So, there quick question. Limitations in this area on how much you can go wider or how much you can go deeper, how far you have to be from the property lines. Great question. Seven and a half feet are your sub counts. And that's on this, this particular lot. Right. Most city lots are typically 50 by 100. Yeah. All right. So, Sorry. question. I noticed uh, that the exterior is pretty much done first, and then I guess the interior. Now you're working on it. What's the reason behind it? Weather, okay. yeah. Keep the insides for the winter. I had a question over here. Yeah, what's your uh, expected listing price for this one? And for most of your houses, are you getting multiple um, offers at the list price and getting to a little bit of a bid up? Great question. We do, and that's a that's a great question. And then you know, and there's n no worse feeling in the world than turning down uh, somebody that wants your house. You know, an owner occupant. Looking for a house, looking for a house, looking for a house. And always the highest offer is not your best offer. So this is something that we've gotten better at too because there's nothing worse than um, getting a house under contract with the wrong person, right? You got a nervous Nelly, they get an inspection report back, and all of a sudden the inspector puts the fear of God in him, and we all know they do that, right? Yeah, what's the biggest what's the biggest deal killer in this business inspector these dang inspectors, inspectors you know um, they got to justify that price tag yeah charging. I mean you know and I know man we're gonna I'm gonna fix it for this ain't no big deal you know but these inspectors they come over here and all of a sudden they walk out and think wow this beautiful house is the worst house on the planet it's got mm -hmm. all these things wrong with it mm -hmm. I don't want it you know so you know, there's a lot of bullet points as far as when you're doing renovations from getting from start to finish. And, of course, we just talked about all of that. But now your question leads to how do I get to the closing table and make my money, right? So, yes, you, we get multiple offers in every single one of our houses. So, say we list it for 200 and we get a 205 or a 210 or, or you know, a couple at uh, 200. What do I look for? Do I look for FHA? Do I look for conventional? Do I look for somebody that has the Atlanta dream or somebody that's doing Invest Atlanta? Uh, all of those things. You get all of those type of offers in there. And the offer I'm always going to pick is the conventional offer. Why? Because a lot of times FHA, if you don't own a house for six months, they do two appraisals. First appraisal might appraise. You know, you never, appraisals, you never know the appraisal issues. Um, that's why as soon as we're done with the rehab, first thing I do with our photographs, I send them to my appraiser. And I say, I need my, I need my house updated on the appraisal. So I, there's always an appraisal on my countertop. And I'll, you know, that way, the biggest fear of anybody, they're saying, well, there's no way this house is worth 200 That house over there is 50000 you know. So you run into that. So, but if you got an appraisal, they can see how you came up with that particular value. Two hundred is your plan for this price for this house here? That's a good price. I like that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was part of his question. You know, <coughs> typically the after repair value is versus what you think you can push it up to because of your level of repairs and sex use. You can't sell a house where you don't have support. You can't. You got to support that value somewhere. Um, you know, the argument is, is there any like kind over here? You got a lot of support that away. You know, somebody may say it's a different neighborhood, all that. You know, at the end of the day, 
you put a house on the market and you had multiple offers, okay, and then you put on your listing, your listing sheet, you put highest and best due Tuesday by 6. Okay, so now the appraiser, the bank, the mortgage people, everybody knows that you had demand of this particular house. So there's a desire, and, you know, like my dad always used to say, what's a house worth? What somebody's willing to pay for, it, right? So, you know, you just, I don't know, there are crazy inspectors out there, and there's crazy appraisers out there, and you're probably going to run into them in your career somewhere, somehow. Now, uh, might just befriend them and talk civil to them and try to reason through any type of concerns that you have. Um, the price, is that where we're at? Mm -hmm. Back in the day, I used to sell houses and you didn't have comps, so you sell it on a first mortgage and I'd take back a second mortgage, then that would create a comp, then I'd do another and another. Do you ever do anything like that to see your market? <laughs> no, 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 never not, never done anything like that. But developing this will be your seed though, right? What's that? This house will be one of your seeds for this area as well as, well as your buddies down the street. You know, down. Yep, and the one on Richmond and then the one two that we had on Adele. Yep. Um, but as far as setting the comps, when do I know? When do I know that magic number? That's what you asked me, right, Dustin? Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, I really don't worry about that until like I'm about a week out. You know, then I'll go into my system and I'll say, okay, well, who's got something listed? Doesn't mean that it's sold, but who has something listed and when will that sell hit as a comp? So that's what I look for. And then I may, you know, I take a real close look at that product and I say, okay, what's the finishes on this particular property? Is it equivalent to mine? What's, how far is it from my, my property? All of those type of things. So, you know, when I come out with a price for a house, it's rock solid. You can't argue with, with right. that number. Does that make sense? So when you do the deal, you're kind of guessing at what the after repair value is going to be. Months go by as you're rehabbing it, fixing it up, and that number may stay the same or may likely go up based on what's occurred in the market over those past few months. Yeah, and, and you should always monitor your working area to see what's coming, coming up and new. And, you know, I've been very fortunate. We've sold houses in areas where the appraiser had to go out to support it. You know, we could have easily been shot down, you know, and, so, and then I would have lost how much money in this deal. <laughs> but for whatever reasons, they give, you know, we've been given grace um, with these appraisers. I mean, Dustin knows that on the Gertrudes and Donald Lee and Parsons and Ashby mm -hmm. Grove. I mean, whoever sold houses over there for 200 and 220, I mean, that's just unheard of. Yep. Nobody. You we were the, the first people in Vine City to sell a house for 200 and 220. And they had to grab comps over Interstate 20 uh, to support it in the West End. And it was bank approved, FHA. So he's dramatically improving the property values in these areas. So you have a lot of properties on Donald Lee and stuff? In that area? Yeah. Like the 30318 yeah. area? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. Mike, uh, we're still on the price. Do you get it appraised before you start the rehab? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. I get an appraisal done the minute I have a house under contract. Even before you close it? Mm-hmm. That's $400 you'd ever spent. <laughs> I mean, I know the comps he's going to use, <laughs> but still, I don't want anybody to say it came from me. I want it to come from a certified appraiser that's licensed, that's accountable, and the appraisal review board of it had to come down to it. How do you decide what house you're going to work on as a rehab and what you're going to wholesale to somebody else? Okay. Didn't we answer that question, yeah. Austin? Right. You you sort of did. Yeah. Okay. We, you you answer specific. I love you, Art. You, you can ask the same question twice. I don't mind. <laughs> I love you we, too. We definitely uh, we definitely asked a question specifically about this house and why you decided not to wholesale it because it needed way too much work for your average wholesaler. Mm -hmm. But in general, 
Uh, well, in general, the um, typically houses that I can't wholesale, I keep. I mean, houses that are just so far gone, and people think, "Yeah, oh my God, and, yeah, yeah," and hey, no big deal. Yeah, because a lot of people say, "Well, if if it's such a a great deal, why are you wholesaling it? Why wouldn't you fix it yourself?" Right, you hear that all the time. In fact, the ones I wholesale are my best deals. And of course, if I'm finishing up a house and I got to send a crew somewhere. I gotta give them a house, you know. So, so it's usually the ones you have hanging around. Which yeah, around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Question over here. Um, regarding selling the house, do you recommend, especially for the ones that are starting like me, do you prefer to get a real estate agent or maybe use one of these sites that are popping up, showing that they charge you a flat fee to sell the house? How do you? How do you? Don't ever use a flat fee agent. Don't ever, 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 ever. So in this business, just don't cut any corners. Tell us why, Mike. Don't cut corners, man. It'll just come to bite you. If you want full retail on something, man, you got to man up and pay the people. And flat fee, you know what? You know what? Uh, other real estate agents are gonna say, we ain't gonna call you and your dumb listing with a flat fee agent. That's gonna have that. They're gonna say they're gonna make you do all the work. They ain't gonna do no work for you. They're not gonna do any contracts. They're not gonna like, negotiate your inspection report they're not going to work through issues that crazy uh, we had a question come in from Andy you were just mentioning um, one of the first things you do when you get a property under contract is get an appraisal their right. question was you do a full appraisal or a desktop appraisal no I do a full so if anybody that's on my distribution list you can see when I send out my properties what do I send out I send you out a property flyer right then I send you out a repair estimate right and then I send you out uh, an appraisal. Okay. So it takes me a half a day to put together all my marketing when I sell out a house. Yeah, I mean, it's not like it's, you could do this in 10 minutes. Uh, you know, I go in there and everything is thought out. Question right and of course, everything's at what? 65 yeah, cents on the dollar. Okay. Not um, <laughs> if you want 70, I get you 70. <laughs> um, Good answer. When you're doing your retail sales, um, I know your wife does a lot of your listings. Is that correct? Right. I okay. So. And um, and then on the back end, um, does she do any pre-marketing uh, when you all have a listing? Obviously, you have a bunch of agents who follow you all, keep track record, have buyers and come into that. Um, for somebody who doesn't have, say have that record for a lot of new investors, that are just kind of getting started, they want to maybe pre-sell a house, or what What was your suggestions in coming in forward with that information? Um, so like, you know, do you offer an, an extra commission, you know, for if you get it sold before you hit throw it on the market, or? All right, that's a real good question. And so we run into, and that, that's a good thing about all of this. This is not classroom stuff. Everything that comes out of my mouth is it's do experience. experience. Yeah. There's no price tag from 21 Experience and flipping 2,000 houses, okay? Nobody's got my track record in this town. I don't say that upon my chest, but what comes out of my mouth is all true, factional stuff that I do on a day-to-day -day basis that people that run their mouths in seminars haven't done. So that's another good question. People banging our door for our next product, okay? And they say, Mike, can I just get the address of the next house that you're going to have listed? And what do I say? No, we don't show you our house until it's show ready. Okay, why? Why do we do that? Because people can't, you know, if I send somebody over here and... They want ambition what you have. They don't, they don't have the envision. There's a couple reasons. One, I can't sell it to them right now because it's not finished, right? I'm not going to sit and wait for... Uh, and one thing in, in this business, and even when you're selling houses, you got to create an urgency with people. You know, so we list our houses on Tuesday. We got multiple offers by the weekend. We got the done deal bef uh, before Monday comes. And I created an urgency there. And pe there's something about that. People want, you want what he has, don't you? <laughs> he wants what you have. Um, and that's how sales sales works. Um, <clears throat> so, no, we don't we don't pre-list nothing. 
we just don't do that. And then once we put it out there, pow! So now you better, you better, you better act. come on, yeah, get on. You give me, I want some earnest money now, you know, get this signed, all this kind of thing. Let me talk to your mortgage guy, make sure that you're good, all that type of stuff. And, you know, people like to put stuff under contract with this. This is somebody that's been, been looking for months and months and months. Finance. And, um, you know, they, they have experience. They say, okay, my last house fell through because the inspection report. Okay, well, now they're not going to be so anal when they go to your house and say, I'm not going to nitpick everything and be a total jack wagon because last time I did that, they told me to go fly a kite and terminate my contract. Okay, so, you know, new beginning investors, sometimes they get strong-willed and they think they know everything and all that kind of thing, and you just got to work through that. So if somebody already went through the process and they said, okay, I had two contracts on stuff ready and it fell through, uh, man, I need to get a house now. It's been way too long. You know, my, my, my parents are thinking I'm crazy and we just got to do something. Um, so that's a seasoned buyer for you. Does that make sense? Yep. Somebody that is ready to go. So, now, but now if you got a newbie that just got qualified like yesterday with their pre-qual letter, you know they might kick. They're, gonna, they're the tire tire kicker people, right? Do you want one of those? So going back to, you know, the multiple offer and when you sell stuff and stuff, take your time. I mean, take your time and really read the contracts that they wrote you. And call the mortgage people, talk to your realtor, and make sure you got the best best one. Now, Mike, speaking about your buyers, like you were earlier, you said you got a lot of millennials, a lot of singles, mm -hmm. a lot of couples, uh, not a whole lot of families. Right. Um, when it comes to getting them funded, are they, are they doing first time home buyer? Are they doing FHA? Are they doing conventional? What's typical for your price range and your sexy rehabs? FHA still dominates the market. They do. I mean, who doesn't want 3.5% down? I mean, FHA gives you a lot of bells and whistles. It's a real simple and easy loan to process. Um, and, you know, they'll accept all of the grants and, um, you know, in-town in buying privileges that you have and stuff. So once you get one under contract, typically um, how long before they actually close the loan process? I'm at 30 days. If somebody writes me a contract with it longer than 30 days, I'll ask them why. And then you'll, they'll probably, and then they don't even disclose. That's the thing that really gets me. They don't tell me that they had the Georgia dream or none of that. They don't disclose that until you sign the contract. Oh, my buyer decides to go to Georgia dream. What does that mean? That's another two weeks, right? Because that's a second loan that they got to do. Uh, here's another point I want to make about when you're getting offers in, okay, so if I list this house for 200 or whatever price and I get an offer at 210, most people will go ahead and say, I'm taking that 210, right? But you know what? The house probably is not going to appraise right. for 210. Yeah. So that number is irrelevant. So if I still circle back to who is my strongest buyer? Who do I feel most comfortable with? Who wants my house the most? Who's going to be the easiest to work with? What is my relationship with the other agent? How cooperative are they? When you're, when you're doing your rehab, right, your first rehab, do you recommend using your own money or getting like a 203K loan or hard cash loan or what do you recommend? That's a great question. That's one of the first funding questions we've had today. Right. Okay, so funding question. <laughs> I would say... People sleep better at night when they're leveraging their money. What do you think? Yep. All right. Do you want to use other people's money or you want to use all your money? I'll use it somebody else's. <laughs> I'll use your money. You really want to use mine? <laughs> uh, if I can get it cheap enough. Cheap enough, yeah. yeah cheap enough. I'll borrow from you, Art, if it's 4%. <laughs> but any event, uh, when it comes to hard money and stuff, I mean, you know, when I first got started in this business, it, it all comes to how cheap can you borrow money? Because at the end of the day, I mean, my goal on all my rehabs is I got a net 20. 20 I got a net 20%.
So if I'm selling this for 200, I've got a net 40 grand on it. Yeah, and that was uh, Tony's question earlier. He said, what percent of return is a good deal? Mm -hmm. so you just answered it. So, <clears throat> hey, if I make 35, am I gonna be disappointed? Is some money better than no money? Yep. Is, is experience have value to it? Yep. Do you ever rehab and rent, or you just rehab and sell? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> Repeat, the <laughs> Repeat the question, Mike. All right, she asked, do I ever do any buy and holds where I do all fix and flips? Um, before the crash, I had 93 rental properties on Section 8. Wow. We gave out a lot of Christmas cards, man. <laughs> <laughs> we love you, Mr. Mike. Come on over. Fix some toilets for me, all right? <laughs> I loved all my tenants. Um, so getting back to the rental thing, I've acquired a lot of my wealth through rentals. So I got started in 96. Um, my credit got solid about 98. Then I bought a bunch of rental properties. And within five years, we went through a time like right now where there was a lot of appreciation. And I refinanced my whole portfolio out because it about doubled in value at 75 cents on the dollar, I walked out of closing with a check over seven digits. And that was, it was not a taxable event, tax-free. Would you recommend doing that again? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Did you take yeah. that and you okay. put it in the other properties? You yes, know, I was home free. Buy you got a million dollars to work with, life is pretty good, isn't yeah. it? So you just took those and bought more properties as cash down. Did you borrow as well still? Like, would you borrow money and use okay. that money to put down for cash and then you buy other rental properties or other homes to rehab and just start the process over and you, so you, it's whatever your comfort level is is okay how much money do you want in, in the bank what does your business take to operate for me flipping I mean I always got a half a half a million in the tank because you never know I might have tents sitting here I'm gonna wholesale next week this or this or this you know so you don't, don't ever want to be undercapitalized uh, when you when with your working op operation and the most beautiful thing about it but what's bank money I mean you could get rental bank money at five and a half percent I mean would you rather do that route so say you did a rental property and you use all your cash and then all of a sudden you pull it out you put a loan on it for five and a half percent. Okay, well you're using that money now. You got a rental property; it's cash flowing for you, and now you have operating capital where you can do a fix and flip instead of paying, uh, let's say, two points and twelve percent on the money. You're borrowing your own money at five and a half percent. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. So always trying to leverage your money. Turn it. I'm, I'm new to it, right? So let's just say you purchase a home and it's slightly under 900 square feet, right? You said something about 12, but you have a really good lot. Do you recommend keeping that house at the size and don't do the additional add-on and just like making a nice patio for outdoor space, for living space, or do you recommend putting the add-on, like knocking out the back? Yeah, back 900 line? square feet just does not work. Not anymore. It's really hard to move a 900 square foot house. Um, <laughs> You know, one thing that I'm thinking about doing this coming up year is trying to market some houses that are only two bedrooms. I have a, I have a three you bedroom, know? but I want to knock it and make it a two bedroom. So like a, a small cottage house. Exactly. Yeah, okay. So you now, now, now this is something that I've been going back and forth on. So if you go into a house and you, most of your inventory around here is two ones and three ones, right? 1,000 square feet, 1,200 square feet. Okay, well, that's not much of a product that you could really push values with. So what do you got to do? You either put addition on, which is expensive, and now prices are higher. So I'm thinking, let me go ahead and take two bedrooms, make them into one. So if I got two bedrooms right here, let's say this is your two bedrooms right here. Okay, so here's bedroom number one. You blow out the wall. And then what we do is we do a little hallway, and then you got your his and her closets right here, mm -hmm. right? Okay, you put your shower right here. You got your double vanity right here, and then you got your toilet right next to your shower. Okay, so now you have a very desirable living space. Mm -hmm. You got a tricked out master. Well, now you're advertising your house. It's only it's going to be a two-two instead of a 
three one. Well, or three two. So your other option would have been, okay, here's my second bedroom. All right, do it now. I, I got to go ahead and do addition to make it a three two. And those additions are timely. They cost money. You got to deal with permit stuff. Um, so that's just a food for thought. But if you do like a outdoor space, like just extending the patio, because people like to be outside, right. that doesn't cost as much as the add-on for like the permits and everything like that, correct? I wouldn't recommend buying houses less than 900 square feet. Okay. Like that at that. Just when, just people. Unless you're going to blow out. Unless you're Unless you add square footage, yeah. Well, how do you know when it's worth it to buy a house that's less than 900 and blow it out? Well, I buy houses that are 900 square feet all day long, but I do an addition on them. Yeah. Because for whatever reason, I, 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 people just don't go look at houses that are 900 square feet for $200,000. So he's able to buy them and blow out the back and turn it into a product. So basically you need want. to find a team to where you can get it so where you have your expenses low enough to where you can add them on. Right, if you buy it cheap enough, it really doesn't matter. So be very, very careful. Make sure you absolutely know what you want to do at your house before you purchase it. And make sure you got room in your budget to make those adjustments. You previously said that if you do the 3 2, you want to be to 14 to 1500 square feet range. So if you do the 2 2, what do you think is a, is a good square footage for, for that? You misunderstood me. My threshold is about 1,200 square feet. Okay. Um, like the house we did on 2012, Joseph E. Boone. That house was only 1106 square feet, and we sold it for 170. That's the only house. Everybody know where Joseph E. Boone yeah, is? Yeah. <laughs> I love you guys. <laughs> you guys know my neighborhoods. <laughs> so, you know, we were really concerned on that house. Because you walked in and it was a real puny living room and we didn't have a dining room. We had to make a combo and we put an addition on the back of that one too. And, you know, I was, I was concerned about that product. I really was. I'm thinking, well, you know, it don't have that kick butt open floor plan and all that, but flew off the shelf for 170 And my appraisal really it was at 160 and I say, well, and we just sold another investor friend of mine house on Chicago Avenue for 160, and it was 150 square feet bigger. But like Dustin says, I like to push values, make sure they keep going. Uh, mm -hmm. So we went with 170. We didn't have a problem with it. Adding a second story. Is that in comparison to adding square footage on a single level of the house, more expensive or? Great question. To do a two stories that we said? going up. Instead of blowing out the back, blow, blow go up. Yep, and I got a two story rehab going on right now at 657 South Grand Avenue. That's going to be my first two story uh, addition. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, in general, is it, is it typically more expensive to go up? Or to go out? No, it's a lot cheaper. I mean, if you're going up, you're killing two birds with one stone. I mean, your square footage obviously is going to, uh, price per square footage is, is 25 to 35 percent less. A lot of more people go up than out. That's a good question. <laughs> a lot of times it's not really necessary. So if you go to 661 South Grand Avenue, the house right next door to it, Okay, I'm not doing a two-story addition. First, my original plans was a two-story, but then I said I really don't have to do this two-story because um, my existing space was enough that I didn't have to do that. Okay? So all I had to do is I, I said, okay, I got my living room, dining room, kitchen. I got my bedroom, bedroom. Okay, let's just kick out the back and do the whole shebang thing right here with the master suite and all the addition. So that was a different scenario. Um, whereas 657, it was a smaller house that had a farther setback and it warranted to have to, I, I couldn't have done, my addition would have been too big and too costly. So the only way really to do is to go up. 
So if this works, I mean, I, that's going to be my new floor plan. I mean, I'll buy all these little dink houses all over town and do two-story additions on them. That's the question. Do you have an average price per square foot, and how much does that change when doing the addition? No, I don't have an average price per square foot. Not at all. Every house has its own identity to it. Uh, every neighborhood has its own price point to it. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, once we go back to, we, we talked about square footage before with that 900. You know, at the end of the day, the appraiser is only going to give you so much for your square footage. He's only going to give you so much value um, for your build out. And that's just the way it goes, or for your deck. So that's why square footage is, uh, is instrumental. And if I see a wholesale deal or a junker out there that's like 200 square feet or 1,800 square feet, man, I'm just salvaging because that's big money. Like the house on Rockmart. I mean, you got the square footage right there. You could push that house to 260 because it's 1802. I got a couple questions from the uh, live audience before I get to yours. Um, David asked, how many rehabs do you typically do a month? I usually got at least six to eight going at all. And that keeps your crews pretty busy. Yeah. All right. And we usually got about 15 listed at one time. No, uh, we were talking about permitting earlier. Mike was curious, how long does it usually take for the city to issue a building permit? Well, if you're lucky, you get one the same day. <laughs> if you're lucky. If, if, uh, if you've got a full set of plans, it goes into the review. But you walk out, there, you walk out of the office with a BB number. And it'll start with BB 2008, blah, 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 blah. So you got your building permit number. It doesn't mean that you, you're approved yet. But usually within the week, they'll come back and say, you know, here, here's your permit. But... When you could go in there the same day and you could pay your fees and get it done with. All right. Two more quick questions um, based on what you said about having that many renovations a month. Uh, David asked, how many crews do you have? Four crews. Four crews. All right. And then um, Tony asked, what is the average time you hold the property, buy, rehab it, and then sell it? What's that average holding time from start? finish well, the goal close. the goal is to turn turn your money three times a year so every four months you should be in and out of your property now can you get in and out of a full rehab like this in four months if your permit process goes without a hitch yes it all depends on the city I mean if you got permit issues and you got to get your structural engineer to get a letter and all that kind of thing no you know so but it is what it is uh, you what do you think about buying raw land and building from new on it? Um, buying lots. Yep, I'm doing my first new build on St. John's Avenue right now, so to speak. So that goes well, Art. I'm going to do more of them. Have you ever heard of a no plan permit? How good are they? I've heard of them before. A no plan permit? Yeah. Well, all my houses have plans, so. Oh, okay. <laughs> Someone, t like if you wanted to do, let's just say knock down a wall or an add on, but didn't want like the people to come and like red tag you, then you apply for like a no plan permit. So this way it keeps, it kind of keeps them out your hair. That's what, yeah, you know, that's what I know about it. Well, I know they got a uh, three sheetrock rule. If you're not replacing more than three sheetrock, we're not doing any alterations, you can get a permit. Good luck with that one. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, um, if you have going kind of back to your buyer and the bu style and everything, what is crucial um, with the layout? So you got a kitchen. Do they really need a dining room, especially being millennial type buyers, young professionals, usually couples, single people? Do they do they take into account the dining room space? So if you have a smaller dining room with say a you know high top with two chairs or versus a you know traditional dining room style, do you see a lot of that, or you just kind of put it aside or you know, would, would you rather, if you have a bigger kitchen versus the smaller dining room, or how would you like to see that? That's another phenomenal, great, great question. It really is. And, you know, when I go back and I look at my rehabs from the past year, I say to myself, could I eliminate the dining room? 
Because you're right, because what do you have? You got your living room, you got your dining room, your kitchen, right? right. Okay. Well you probably got a fourteen by fourteen, a twelve by twelve, and a twelve by twelve. Maybe not even that. <laughs> right. So you say to yourself, Okay, let me see. Whoever sits in a dining room? Does anybody ever sit in a dining room? Uh, Thanksgiving, right? Yeah. Christmas. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So we haven't tried it yet, but those are two things that I'm going to experiment this year. One is the two-bedroom concept that we talked about to eliminate the additions if the house is 1,200 square feet. And secondly, will the house have more of a pop, more of a wow effect if you have a bigger kitchen with more cabinets and a big island, right? Exactly. Yeah, if you have an island where people can sit on. Exactly. So now if you have your nice little island and all of a sudden, you know, you could talk to your wife while she's preparing food, turn around here, watch the ball game, right. life is good, right? Mm -hmm. And then you say, okay, does this, is, is that more, people got more of a demand for that? So I'm going to throw that out and I'm going to talk to uh, people that are looking at our houses coming up and stuff and maybe talk to realtors and clients and see what do they want? What do they want? And I'm just thinking, hey, you know, it's just uh, it, you got a bigger living room. Maybe put a fireplace in there somewhere, and you got a nice big island. And that island is going to be your sitting area, your congregation area. So why do you really need a dining room? You don't. Right. You don't. Yeah. Now, if you had a thir three thousand square foot house or something, right. that's a whole different animal. Right. But yeah, you're talking fifteen, sixteen hundred square feet, maybe. Or even twelve hundred. Oh, yeah, even twelve hundred. Right. Even, yes. Or even your nine hundred square foot house. Yeah. The starter. The starter. Yeah. <laughs> so those are just thoughts. I mean, you because people are gonna. What's the most functional component of this property that's people are gonna like? So yeah. Do you have a question over here? It's kind of like a question, but a thought. You said two two. I was looking at something to do that, and I got shot down by some of my uh, friends because I wanted a, a two-bedroom. It was 1,200 feet. The price was wonderful. It was, the house was going for 16000 I should have went with my gut and got it, but it was a three-bedroom, but I wanted to. I should have. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think the two-two, I like that concept because I would have it for myself. So I would. Mm -hmm. I, the, it depends on the area. I think that neighborhood, some people like, I like the two, too, but I want my two nicely, you know. Yeah, bit. so I know that's, that's some, those are just two things I like the idea cause I uh, we're going to experiment with and see what the demand is. Right. Well, I'm here. So for the smaller, for the guy that just get into it, how much work can you get in, let's say for instance, this property, before you get your permits, the fences, can you start working on anything? Before you get the permits, like, I mean, you got multiple properties, but the guy that only have one or maybe two, you know, he, okay, I have to wait for my permits. So in the meanwhile, my crew don't have anything to do. Um, is there something that they can start doing before no, you get your permits? No, just get your permits, man. Just don't even. Don't even bother. Just, no, you need a permit. You need a permit. Just get your permits. Part of the process. Just accept it. <laughs> get good at it. You're going to be in trouble. Yeah. Um, about the inspections, what is the process of these guys coming and checking from the city? I'm not sure about that. How, how does that work? When you know you get a permit, you have to fix this, this, and that. But what is the process of they coming and checking? I'm not sure if there is like a schedule or something that well, they. Yeah, you got to call in your inspections. Yeah, you got a permit card. You got everybody's phone number. And you just... All right, we had a question online. This is David again. He was the one interested in your cruise. It's kind of a long, it's, it's like two questions. So you have four crews doing eight deals a month. What's the average renovation cost? Takes me two man crew three to four weeks to do a 40,000 rehab. Okay, my rehabs are on a 10 week schedule. So if everything goes the way it's supposed to go, I'm out in 10 weeks. I got the house listed and sold and got my money back in four months, and I do it again. So how big are your crews? You get four of them. How big are they? Well, everybody, when I say crews, the, the, the key components of my crews are my carpenters because they're doing 75% of the work. Okay, then I got 
roofers, I got my electricians, I got my plumbers, I got my heat and air, I got my kitchen guys, I got my flooring guys, uh, I got my tile guys. Does that make sense? Yeah. So those guys are not those guys can go float from job to job to job to job to job. But the guys that are normally on my job would be the contractor guys, which also we do my punch out at the end. So those are the core guys that can do anything for me if I need it done. And part of his question was, uh, you're, I mean, this is obviously the one we're looking at now is a ninety thousand dollar rehab. What is average for you that you're doing these days? It's ninety. Yeah. yeah. No, I would say sixty to ninety. Yeah, say a lot of the ones I've seen sixty to ninety are, are the big four. Yeah. Sixty nine. Yeah. Yep. Is this a full electrical, like a, a new electrical? Like the, All, yeah, everything's electrical. And how much was something like a full electrical on this car? 3500 for a rough. Really? <laughs> <laughs> My little house, someone quoted me almost 8000 <laughs> Maybe because I'm a girl. Ooh. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that hurts. All right, now Chris asked a question online. He might not have been here to hear this earlier. Uh, it was about, do you pull your own permits, or does your contractors pull them? No, my contractor pulls the permits. All right. And then um, this next question is from David again. He's the guy asking about the crews. Uh, are they sub uh, so their subcontractor is not on your payroll? What's his question? Subcontractor is not on Everybody's on my payroll. Yep. Everybody's on Mike's part. Dave, you might have mentioned, uh, missed it early, but uh, Mike is the GC. So they're all his subs, <coughs> and they're on his payroll. He keeps these crews busy year-round. They don't work for anybody else. Any other last-minute questions? Just, just a quick, I just want to, um, carports versus, versus garage. Which one is, do you make the carport a garage, or do you just leave it like that? Or Because I heard a lot of people want to, keep the garage just because of the personal stuff you can go and you only have a carport great question i don't know if it's a neither question. <laughs> that's a good question. neither neither but that's a good question so if i have a house and it has a carport what am i going to do with yeah, that carport close i'm going to close the <laughs> stinking thing and add what square, square, square footage. footage what does square footage do Money. Money. yeah that's what i do with the carports that's your free ticket to free square footage now, if you got a house that's boring or something like that, I put a pergler in the driveway. You know what that is? Pergler? Yeah. To dress it up, give it that fancy pants look type of thing. Any last minute questions for Mike? We want to get in here before we wrap things up? All right, well, thank thanks for coming. Thank you. Two, two more before we do the applause and <laughs> thank you. She, she can go first. All right, ladies first. Well, being a new investor and you get your contractor, do you, um, do you let him uh, pull everything you need, or do you need to get in there with him and and see? Even with the crews, do you? How, being a first time, okay, I'm rehabbing this house. I need me a contract. Do I just trust that he gonna know what to do, or do I? Yeah, that's a tough one right there. Um, if you're gonna get a contractor. Hopefully it's a referral from somebody that you trust. And then, yeah, you got to validate everything. Where do you get your haircut? <laughs> <laughs> I pay 15 bucks at Great Clips. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. He has some snazzy boots on today. Yeah. Yeah. That's Kmart, ninety nine, ninety nine. No. Uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> All right, we, had, we got one more here. Money land. No, I don't. Where's Mark at? We had a... Um, Where did Mark go? We had a lender here earlier standing over here in the corner. Yeah. He might have slipped out. But yeah, we usually have a couple lenders show up. Are you guys lending money right now? Uh, yeah, we have a sister company, Sherman Bridge Lending. So I thought so. Money loans. I yeah, thought Sherman so. Bridge is good. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right, we got one final question from the live <laughs> audience on Facebook. It's a good one to wrap things up with from Alex. What are your top three money savings tips for the first time investor doing a fix and flip? Oh, that's a good one. Top three money saving tips. Don't do things twice. Get it right the first time. That's a good one.
Read all your invoices when you buy materials. Make sure it's going to your job sites. Control waste. A lot of times your contractors are going to overorder. And why is all this lumber? Why is all this? Why is this? Why is, this? Why is all this? We used to have a big problem with that. Waste. In fact, I had to buy one of those pods because we had so much waste. You put all your things in there. I said, guys, this got to stop, man. This got to stop. They don't want to go back to Home Depot and lug it back there because that takes a couple hours to do. So they've learned to order what they need and not to overorder. And your third money-saving tip is don't be scared to spend a dollar if you're going to get a dollar fifty back. Yep. Don't be scared to spend money on your rehab. That's your investment. The nicer you make it, the more demand it's going to have, and the higher you're going to be able to sell it. If I see one thing with newbies, you know, people that are new, they're on a budget. They don't think they're going to sell their house for what they anticipate. You have fear because you're fearing there's so many unknowns if you've never done this before, correct? Correct. That's just natural. It's human nature. You fear. Fear is a horrible component, a horrible emotion to have. And, and if I convey anything to anybody today, it's just to increase your confidence that this business is real it's doable. It's not that big of a deal. Don't make a big deal about it. Just go ahead and do it. That's why, you know, when somebody buys a, you know, gold mine properties, property, one of my wholesale deals, man, we're here to help you from A to Z. Call me at any time. I'm here to make sure that you're successful, you make money, and you rinse and repeat. And that's about it. Hopefully everybody got a little bit of info today. And just give it up to Mike. Thank you. Now, Mike, uh, when do you think this project will be finished? And will, will we be able to come see the finished product? Yeah, we got to talk to the City of Atlanta Permit Department on that one. <laughs> um, yeah, I got some cards in there. Yep. Oh, yeah, we should do some, uh, we should do some when they're listed, when they're completely done. Yeah, we've done it before. Yeah. With the, uh, one of the ones over in uh, Bayan City. Okay. You took it, you, we started off with two houses that are being rehabbed, then you took us down the street, saw the finished product. Well, let's do this. I, I do it. Rock Mart's in the sheetrock trim stage right now, so that should be wrapped up in about a month. Yeah, we'd love to come back and uh, see some of your finished product. Yeah, long. that way you can. 65. Yeah, because I think um, uh, Don was there when we were there last time. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I was out of town. Mm -hmm. So, all right, thank you, everybody. All right, man, appreciate, appreciate you. It, man. Thank you so much, man. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. Thank you guys for coming. I hope you enjoyed it. We do this at least once a month on the third Tuesday of every month at noon. So we hope you'll come back and see us again. So stick around, do some networking, exchange some business cards. We hope to see you at another meeting again real soon. Goodbye, everybody.